never forget that this happened. It's really one of the scariest moments of my life, and I just really hope nobody ever has to go through this firsthand. Because let me just tell you, it left my wife and I at a complete loss of words. So what exactly am I referring to all of you, and what makes my experience so much different from others that you might have heard on YouTube? Well, let's start off with the events that led up to it. For some context, this was on New Year's Eve of 1999 and takes place in southern Arizona, near the United States-Mexico border. My wife and I were at her grandparents' New Year's get-together and we had stayed there all the way until 2 in the morning. This meant we welcomed in the new year with their grandparents, aunts, uncles, nephews, cousins, brothers, sisters, the list goes on. Now, the original plan was to spend the night at her grandparents' house and then make the two-hour drive back home that following afternoon. However, we had two cats at the time and we didn't want to leave them the entire day on their own since the youngest one liked to jump onto countertops and toss things everywhere. Spoiler alert, not for the scary part of this story, but in general, when we got home, the place was a mess. It looked as if a tornado had just passed through. We blamed this on the fireworks, which must have caused the cats to go crazy. Again, that's not really part of the scary story, but just a silly detail I thought was worth mentioning. Anyway, by the time we hit the road, it's around 2.30 a.m., and out here in this part of the state, with nothing but desert and stars above you to keep you company, it does become quite lonesome and quiet. That's why my wife and I were surprised when, seemingly out of nowhere, we saw headlights in our rearview mirror fast approaching. Since this was New Year's, I actually started to become a bit frightened due to the erratic behavior of the vehicle. I could see it kept swerving back and forth between both sides of this two-way road. We started thinking, perhaps the driver was intoxicated and drunk and it's at this moment that my wife recommended we drive off to the side of the road into the desert so whoever was driving could just pass us. That's what we started doing. I put on my hazards and drive to the side of the road. But then for whatever reason, this vehicle does the same exact thing. They begin to slow down and then come to a stop a few yards from our vehicle. This was really strange. Why would they come to a halt as well? Whatever the case was, we stayed stationary for about 15 seconds, and then we decided that we were just going to move on. The vehicle, which I could now get a better look at, being a truck, picks up their pace and begins to follow us yet again. This time, they got closer, and even managed to lightly tap the back of our bumper. My wife is freaking out at this moment, meanwhile I'm trying to keep my composure and be brave. Don't get me wrong, part of me wanted to get out of the vehicle and punch whoever this driver was, but I knew that could have been very dangerous, as road rage is a very real thing. Also, this was during a time when cell phones weren't really something you saw with people, so it's not like we could have called for the cops or something. At any rate, this following our vehicle thing continues on for about another 2-3 to three minutes and then out of nowhere, we hear something that sent shivers down our spine. Two very loud bangs that we would later determine came from a gun. My wife and I ducked our heads as after the loud pops, the truck finally ended up passing my wife and I and storming further down the road, finally disappearing and bringing our crazy ordeal to an end. To cut a long story short, we had the police investigate our encounter with these creeps in the truck and we gave them the approximate location, the time, and our best description of their truck. But sadly since that evening, we have never been given an update, nor have we been given a sense of closure if you will. It is very possible that it was either one, drunk people, or two, maybe perhaps it was the cartel. One thing is for certain however, it really gave us quite the scare, and thankfully since that nightmarish evening, we have never had anything remotely as frightening like that happen to us again, and we just hope that it stays that way. The following story that I'm about to present to all of you comes from the perspective of our friend's brother. He used to study in IIT Madras, and is currently in Tata Motors. By the way, this takes place in India. Now, here is that story. 
my friends and I were finally ready to get back to their homes to celebrate New Year's Eve. They went in one car, but due to some medical issues, one friend did not come with us. This meant my girlfriend Tanya and I were the only ones left, so we decided to drive to my house since I wanted to introduce Tanya to my family. So we packed our things and we started the ride back on the highway, and after a while my car started to make some really weird noises, so I decided to check it out. But when I stopped the car and looked inside the hood, I noticed one of the tires was flat. Of course, I didn't have a spare to replace it. Tanya now started to worry, but I tried to calm her down telling her that we were going to sort things out and we would soon be home. I tried to call Tata for roadside assistance. They picked up and said that due to some issues, they were running short-staffed on support agents and they wouldn't be able to get to us for at least 4 to 6 hours. I told them to please make the process faster and they said they were going to do the best they could. Now, where we were on the highway, it looked pretty remote, but thankfully there was cell phone service. Anyway, we got back into the car, reclined the seats, and just sat there eating snacks for a couple of minutes. And then we saw a car pass us, and soon a man walked over and asked if we needed any sort of assistance. He said he was from a company called Cars24. He did offer to take me to the nearest repair shop as he didn't have a jack to lift the car. I looked at Tanya and asked her what she thought and she agreed that we should accept his assistance. So we both hopped into his car and went to the nearest mechanic shop. We knocked on the door and we were welcomed by a poor looking man with white greasy hair, dirty blue jeans, and a black hoodie. We asked if he could help us with a jack to lift the car and he said sure why not while well, I noticed him staring at my girlfriend in a really creepy and awkward fashion. You're very lucky to have such a beautiful girlfriend, he muttered under his breath. Meanwhile, I'm starting to grow a bit concerned, wondering exactly if he was really the right man for it or not. And then suddenly, I heard Tanya shout at the top of her lungs, as the driver who brought us here initially tried to grab my girlfriend by the wrist. It's at this moment it's revealed that this was all a trap, and now my protective boyfriend nature is kicking in. I asked him what he wanted, and he says that we are to hand over all of our valuables, and then he was going to let us go. All I had on me was some cash, which wasn't enough as he now tells me that he would take my girlfriend instead. That made me pretty furious, so I grabbed the nearest iron rod I saw and told him to back off, but then he does something insane. He runs at me, and I instantly whack him in the face, which drops him straight to the ground. The old man, the one with the white greasy hair, now attempts to come at me with a switchblade, but with some effort I do manage to fight him off as well. My girlfriend and I now booked it into the woods, and we hid behind a bush as we can see them running after us. They were inches from finding us, and I can remember just praying to God hoping they were going to leave. They did, but we must have stayed there for about two hours hiding, until I received a call from Tata. They asked me that they had reached the location of my vehicle, but of course, they couldn't find us. I asked them to give me the license plate number, and I felt relieved knowing that they had made it. They said that they would pick us up and all we had to do was actually step over to the highway. Reluctantly, we checked our surroundings and made the scary and anxious long walk back to the highway and we finally felt safe. This is where we saw a truck with its headlights on and we realized it was the vehicle that had called me. We got towed to the nearest town to get the car fixed and we celebrated New Year's with the family in peace. That was the end of that scary evening. Since then, Tanya and I have gotten married, and we have two kids. I thank God for helping me that night, because who knows what might have happened to us had those men spotted Tanya and I. My advice for all of you listening out there, always carry supplies you might need, such as a spare tire, so you can avoid these sorts of situations. Thanks, and Happy New Year to all of you, including Mr. Creepy Fox. May this year fulfill all your dreams, and may you continue to entertain us for the years to come. This was last New Year's, and I remember it well because I had been working overtime at my bartending job. Now, if it really matters to anyone, then I'll state quickly that I'm 25 years old and male. Anyway, after a long night of people drinking to their heart's content, loud music, fireworks, and anything and everything New Year's related, 
I was finally clocking out at 2am. However, I was in the mood for some snacks and a quick meal, so I decided to head over to a nearby gas station I frequented to grab a couple of hot dogs and some nachos. Now, I know having gas station food isn't exactly the most healthiest option, but you know what, I felt like I earned it regardless, even if my stomach suffered later on. Once I arrived, I park at the side of the gas station and step out into the cold January evening. So far, nothing really seemed out of the ordinary. So I walked in and I go to grab my food and sat at one of the counters to quickly devour my late night meal. Once I was done, I head over to the trash can to throw everything away. However, I looked through the front glass window and I could see a pretty shady figure walking around and looking into my car. It was a homeless man who looked to be in his mid-30s. Now, assuming he was going to request money from me, I ended up waiting until he leaves and then I head to my car. However, I think he might have been waiting for me because as soon as I reached my car door, he pops out from behind a nearby trash can. Excuse me sir, but do you have some extra change? I felt pretty generous and so I gave him a few dollars thinking that he was going to leave me alone. He walks off momentarily and I take a seat in my car. The thing is, I'm in a tired state, so I accidentally dropped my keys under my seat, a minor inconvenience, so I went ahead and looked down and grabbed them seconds later. But here's the thing, I had unlocked my car to get inside. This meant that when I looked up from my bent over position, the man that I would just given money to was in the process of opening the passenger side door. Now I don't even get a chance to react as he takes a seat next to me and just sits there awkwardly. Hey, uh, you need to get out. I need to go home. He didn't respond with any words. Instead, he puts his hands into his jacket pocket, where just a few mere seconds later, he takes out a revolver. Now I got the chills as my immediate reaction was to get out of there. However, I was so frozen with fear that I couldn't move. I know most of you will frown up upon me, but unless you're in a situation where you could quite literally be shot to death, you won't know what it's like. Give me the keys and I'll let you go. That was what I remember him saying. This guy was looking to rob my car. Now I don't know what happened next, but it's like a switch turned on in my head and I finally regained my composure. Now risking being shot at, I grab the keys and book it into the gas station. Luckily, I knew the man who was working there who happened to be the manager as he ended up grabbing a shotgun underneath the front counter. Now it was hard to get my words across, but when I said, guy with a gun, it was enough for him to send me to cover. He then takes the shotgun and runs outside. Seriously, the pair on this guy. Anyway, at this point, I'm peeking from inside of the gas station and I can see he has this thing pointed directly at the man who tried to rob me. Now what happens next is the guy with the revolver runs away like a scared cat. Once he was no longer in sight, I ended up calling the police and they searched the immediate area. They didn't find him that evening. However, he was caught a few days later after they reviewed the security footage. This was something I found out when I went to the gas station the following week. And thus, that was the time I was about to be robbed at a gas station at gunpoint until I was saved by the cashier. So thank you friend, I owe you one. Okay, so anyone who grew up in the 90s knew that when it came to having fun and keeping yourself entertained, it often meant being outside. Sure, there were video games, but honestly kids were often seen playing soccer with their friends or at the mall hanging out. I was a bit different. You see, my friends and I were always looking for fun and excitement. That was where we found ourselves one random New Year's Eve evening when my friend and I decided to do a bit of exploring. Now, I guess I should give you some background context, otherwise this story is going to feel a little bit out of place. I was roughly 17 years old, and it was going to be the final winter break I was going to hang out with my friend. She was going to be moving out of the country to attend college the following May, thus we wanted to welcome in the new year with something different. Something kind of dangerous. You see, growing up in the Philippines, you often hear various stories of haunted locations. Now, no, the story is not going to go into something paranormal, but it does give you an insight to what kids are told growing up. Avoid certain areas. 
otherwise the big old ghosts are going to haunt you. I think more than anything it's to keep the kiddos from entering areas that they say don't trespass on, not that we ended up listening. Anyway, this evening my friend and I met up at my house around 6pm and to celebrate the new year we wanted to go ahead and explore this area called Laguna Creek. It's known for its abandoned homes and neighboring haunting road. There was quite a lot of dark history, but again my friend and I were used to these sorts of things. So we went ahead and hop into my jeep with a couple of flashlights, as well as some knives, and we make the 25 minute drive into the neighboring jungle. Now you did have to do a bit of off-roading since the roads weren't exactly paved. That meant the chances of you finding cars was going to be less likely, let alone any signs of people. Nevertheless, we did reach Laguna Creek, parked next to some trees, and we begin looking around the dilapidated buildings. What we found was pretty eerie. Apart from debris and graffiti, we did stumble into human remains. Some skulls were lying by themselves, which really added to the overall feeling of doom. But it's 20 or so minutes later, we are interrupted by somebody's voice. Hey, what are you two doing out here? This area is off limits. My friend and I look around the surrounding darkness and out from nowhere walks a man with an assault rifle and a flashlight. At first we thought maybe he was a military personnel, but he didn't have any sort of recognizable uniform. Even so, we thought that we were now in trouble, so we book it back to the car before he could say anything else. The thing is, our ordeal wasn't exactly over just yet. You see, by the time we made it into the jeep and start driving out of there, a couple of more men step out from the nearby jungle. A looking through the rearview mirror ends up revealing more men holding onto assault rifles. Now, no lie, they now start to fire rounds in our general direction, as one of them ends up hitting the back window, which completely shatters it. In fact, I can still remember the sound of ricocheting metal, as I feared my friend had been shot, but thank God that none of us were. Anyway, to say we were scared was one of the biggest understatements of the century. Once we made it back into the city, we stopped at a gas station to get the full extent of the damage. Apart from the back window, there were a bunch of gunshot holes in the back. You could see a few casings too. We did end up telling the local police department about it and they told us that they were going to investigate it. But unfortunately, I don't remember anything turning up. But we did get quite a scolding from our parents. Nevertheless, we never found the reasoning as to why those men fired at my friend and I to begin with, but we do think that we might have stumbled into somebody's secret meeting spot, perhaps for arms trade, or drug trade too. By the way, soon after that happened, the city deemed the area off limits, and they warned anyone from traveling or exploring that area at all. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. Hey, uh, just to let you all know, for the month of December, I have brought back the Christmas Fox Creepy Fox, which is going to be available all the way until the end of December. These are available in shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. You can pick it up with the link in the description, or you can also check out the little merch shelf right below the video. These are great gifts for fans of the Creepy Fox, or if you know somebody in the family, or you have friends that enjoy my videos. So, if you missed your opportunity to pick up this design last year, now is your chance, as they're going to be available for a limited time. Anyway, let's continue on with the scary stories. When most people talk about their New Year's experiences, they are normally going on about the parties, being around family and friends as you welcome in a new saga of your life. Who had any clue the start to a new year was going to be quite a strange and bizarre one, it was New Year's 2005, and I was going to visit a friend to celebrate the new year. My friend lived about an hour outside of my small Louisiana town. I guess you could say he lived out in the middle of nowhere. Once you left the city limits, you're driving in the countryside with dirt roads. Honestly, if you didn't know better, it was quite easy to get lost out there. However, I had made this drive in the past, so I wasn't exactly too worried. Well, I guess I do sort of lie. You see, the problem had been that I left a little bit later as I had been busy with my work. By the time I was on the road, it was 7pm. It also didn't help that it had been raining that night, but luckily I had my GPS system to guide me. 
So everything had been going pretty normally. I was driving down the roads I was told to go on, rain was hitting my windshields and trees were surrounding my vision and eventually my headlights shine upon something. Someone, I should say. A woman was standing next to a dark blue minivan. I thought to myself, huh, perhaps her van had broken down out there, but what a terrible spot for this to happen in. Regardless, I pull up next to her and then I say, Hey miss, are you stranded out here? What happened with your van? Do you need me to call someone? She responded with, No, that's okay. Can you come outside and help me? I just have to switch the tire, that's all. It's in the back, she said. I agreed to help her, even though something inside me was telling me that there's some really bad vibes going on here. Sure, she looked innocent enough, but to be waiting out there in the rain? It really looked like a setup to a scary movie, or if I was about to be jumped. I mean, as far as I could see, her tire did look to be okay, but maybe that's just because I know nothing about cars. Anyway, I told myself I was being too paranoid, but just in case, I grabbed myself some pepper spray from the glove compartment, and then I head outside. Here's when I first noticed something. Even though it had been raining and it was dark, my headlights were still shining into the woods next to me. This was where I could have sworn I saw movement. Almost like a hooded person had taken a peek from behind a tree, only to quickly move back to cover. Hey, did you see something in the woods just now? I curiously said as I looked into the dark. Nah, you're probably just imagining things. Come on, it doesn't take too long to switch a tire. I walk with her over to the back of the van and then she just opens it. Once it was open, I'm able to see it's empty. No tire of any sort. I was confused. So I turn around, and that's when I see it. She's got a hold of a syringe. I freaked out because she was just a few inches from poking me with it, but I do manage to jump out of the way at the last second, and what I hear her say next was just super creepy. Get her. Those were the words she chose to shout out, as two hooded figures jump out from behind some trees. One has a baseball bat with nails stuck in the end, and another has a large knife. By this point, I'm already booking it back to my car, and once I was in there, I floor it as the last thing I'm able to see or hear are the three jumping into their van and driving into the woods. That was pretty much all there was to that experience. I made it to my friend's house less than an hour later, albeit with quite an adrenaline rush. My friend told me that this was the first time he had heard of something like this happening out there. Many years have passed, and since then, I have heard of similar encounters. Criminals will use somebody to bait you in at the side of the road, only to be waiting for your kindness to kick in. Thus, if there is any advice I would give to all of you, it's going to be this. Be super careful with who you stop for. Make sure that before you leave the safety of your vehicle, you've scanned the immediate area for any sorts of threats. Then again, I guess you could just call for help via your cell phone and wait inside your vehicle. A new year, a new me, an opportunity to start fresh. I mean, why not? Everyone else does it. But unlike my fellow human beings, I don't exactly stick to routines. I mean, let's face it, most people just claim to start fresh, only to quickly drop back to the same thing the following week. While none of this is really important to what I'm about to tell you all, it does give you insight to just how strange this whole notion of New Year's is. With that said, I'm going to take us all on a nostalgia trip back to many, many years ago, to the wonders of the early 1990s. Here's my scary Home Alone story. To begin, I lived in a pretty boring town in the middle of Oklahoma, and it's here I lived in a neighborhood where everybody pretty much knew each other. It was very safe, and common to leave your doors and windows unlocked. And boy oh boy how the times have since changed then. Anyway, I could stay up late, eat all the junk food that I wanted to, and have no worries about the noise I made, for oftentimes I was home alone. Besides, I was used to being home by myself. You see, both my parents worked long hours at their respective jobs, and I would usually arrive home to some leftovers left in the refrigerator. Honestly, I felt safe in my little bubble of a home. Same thing this evening. I remember it was New Year's Eve and my parents had been out of town to celebrate their wedding anniversary. 
I myself was so into Super Mario World stomping on some Goombas, having myself a good laugh at my mistakes while eating some snacks. However, in my quest to save the princess, I remember I kept hearing strange sounds outside my house. It almost sounded like footsteps, the kinds you hear when you're stepping over mud. Now seeing as it was raining, I kept writing everything down to mother nature just trying to freak me out. But then I remember as I was about to beat up one of the castles, the glow and static of my little TV was subtly interrupted with darkness. This was accompanied by the lights in my room going dark. A power outage, I thought to myself. Well, how could that be? Sure, there was quite a bit of thunder and lightning going on outside, but when I looked outside my second story bedroom window, sure enough, the power was out. I was annoyed, but thankfully my dad had shown me how to reset the circuit breaker. This would require me to go into the basement, which I always obviously despised. So anyway, I went ahead and leave the comfort of my blanket and pillow fortress and I started to tiptoe my way down the stairs. Once I reached it, I was hit with a blast of cold air. I couldn't find the source at first, until I noticed that one of the living room windows was slightly open ajar. I sort of had to do a double take, but I told myself I was just forgetful since I hadn't been down in the living room since that morning. So I closed it, but then I noticed that the dry muddy footprints on the ground weren't belonging to mine. I got the chills since I knew for a fact that I hadn't gone out there. This was when I started to connect the noise from earlier, but it couldn't be that somebody was in here, right? After all, I quickly hid behind a couch and listened in, but there was nothing. I must have waited there for a solid 10 minutes, and then I realized that I must have gone outside and just forgotten about it. Anyway, there was still the deal of the power. I head down to the basement, turn the power back on, and halfway up, I hear it. Footsteps. Again, I started to panic. I know for a fact I'm supposed to be home alone, thus who or what could be making the noise. By the way, I should mention that this story isn't a paranormal one, but at the time I honestly thought that my house was being haunted. Nonetheless, I grow the courage to grab a golf club from the basement and then I start sweeping each and every room. I was unable to find anything. This was the point where I thought that maybe perhaps I was just going crazy. So, tired and stressed from my possible over-imagination, I head back to my room and try to get some sleep. It's now approximately 10.30pm. Boring for New Year's, I know, but it couldn't last until midnight. Fast forward to around 2am. A new year. A new me. Well, I now had the sudden urge for a glass of milk. So I head downstairs and right as I'm about to enter the kitchen, I see them. While the fridge is wide open, there is what looks to be like a man sitting next to it and drinking out of a milk carton. I freaked out and instinctively I yelled something like, Dude, what are you doing in my house? But instead of getting the request I so angrily requested in that moment, the guy gets up, turns around and I'm able to get more details. He was a local homeless man who I had seen on various occasions. But what was he doing in my home? That was something I couldn't explain. Not that I was really looking for one, because he was now holding on to one of my parents' kitchen knives. I remember his eyes became like one of an insane person as he started to laugh with a creepy tone. He then started to reproach me without saying a single word. Well, you bet your bottom dollar I booked it upstairs, as I'm able to hear his heavy footsteps start to chase me. Now instead of going to my room, however, I go over to my parents' room which had the only phone in the house. I lock myself in there as I now start to hear the pounding of his fists echo against the door. All of this time, mind you, he hasn't said a single thing, apart from just the strange laughing and the heavy breathing. So now you might be thinking to yourself, what did I do next? Well, luckily my dad had a shotgun under the bed, which I just remembered in that instance. This seemed like the perfect self-defense tool. So I grab it and then get on the phone where I immediately dial 911. Now seeing as it was New Year's, you can imagine police were going to be pretty busy that night. That's why I was expecting for them to take their time. But all it took for me to say was crazy guy with a knife for them to send officers in no more than 3 or 4 minutes. But let me tell you, those 3 to 4 minutes felt like an absolute eternity. Now, not knowing if this dude was about to bust down the door was one of the more frightening things about the whole entire process. But at last, I look out my parents' window 
and I see three police cruisers make their way onto the front lawn. Hurry, there's someone in my house, he has a knife, he's trying to break into the room. I told them from the second story window. The officers went into fight or flight. With no other way in, I remember hearing them bust down my front door, and then a bunch of yelling. Put the knife down! I hear one of the police officers yell in desperation. I then heard the distinct sound of a taser going off and I can hear the man struggling, where soon officers told me that it was safe to step outside. When I left the safety of my parents' bedroom, I went into the living room to talk with the police. It would only be until later that I learned that calling the police officers that night ended up being a good thing. As it turned out, this wasn't the first time that same man had broken into a home and he had been arrested in the past for similar actions. Talk about pretty crazy. But yeah, anyway, that was the time that I was home alone on New Year's Eve and some crazy guy with a knife broke in. After promising to share my story with you for so many months, here it finally is. This was New Year's Eve 2017, and my friends and I are out bar hopping in the cold Oregon winter night. We're having a blast reminiscing about the accomplishments we had achieved that year, as well as talking about all the things that we were looking forward to in the new year. By 2am, my friends have now left the bar, and it's just me waiting for an Uber. My friend Alexis did offer to have her parents drop me off back at my place, but I was sort of out of the way from their home, and I didn't want to be a bother to them. Besides, Ubers are pretty dedicated on New Year's on picking up those out partying, and who might have drank a lot, such as myself. Anyway, even though it was late, there is still a boatload of bar goers having a good time and music playing over the speakers which appeared as if these New Year's festivities were going on into the sunrise. I decided to wait for my Uber directly across from the bar I was hanging out at, at a small swing set. Bear in mind, there is not much light in this small area, apart from the light coming from the parking structure behind me. Which yes, I know that's just asking for trouble, you don't need to tell me twice. Anyway, while I was on my phone, I began to feel as if I was being watched. I blamed this on my partying. And two minutes later, scrolling and looking at all my friends' New Year's posts, I hear leaves crunching all around me. I looked up, making the assumption it's just fellow bar goers. But instead, there's just this dude in a heavy-duty jacket smoking a cigarette and just staring in my general direction. I ignored him and I continued to look down at my phone, which was a big mistake by the way. And just when I thought he had left, I looked up for a brief moment and he's standing just a few feet in front of me. Give me that phone, and any money you have on you. I laughed right in his face, which turned his calm and quiet demeanor into one of pure hatred. I suddenly sobered up when he takes out a small switchblade and tells me that if I didn't do as he said in that moment, I was going to be sorry. As you can already picture it in your head, I started to freak out. But thank god I catch a break when I happen to see a large group of people walking over in my general direction. One of them shouted over to me and said, Hey girl, where have you been? We're still partying, right? The guy with the switchblade suddenly panicked realizing that his cover was blown and he unfolds the switchblade throwing it into his pocket. He then booked it into the parking lot where I never saw him again. As for the group of bar goers, the ones who walked over to me, they said that they had seen the man watching over me and they got a really bad feeling. That's why they decided to come over and check up on me just to make sure that things were okay. Well, they weren't. And if it wasn't for their quick thinking and their quick action, I'm pretty certain that I might have gotten mugged or possibly stabbed. I currently live in North Carolina and I'm married to my beautiful wife Kayla with two kids. But this is a story in which I want to take you all back to when I used to live in Michoacan, Mexico. It was a small pueblo I was born and raised in, and growing up I was always the adventurous type. On days that I wasn't in school, my friends and I would travel into the forests and go about our afternoons fishing at the lake. When at home we'd stay up listening to music and practicing guitar as we dreamed of being in our very own mariachi band. Now, I could spend hours talking about all the great adventures that we had together, 
and maybe one day can share some of those stories if you're interested in hearing them. But for now I want to discuss and talk about this one time that my friend Ricardo and I had this very scary encounter that was all the talk of our town. It was New Year's Eve of 2000. Both Ricardo and I are in my room at roughly 7pm and we were playing some Nintendo 64. Ricardo's parents, as well as mine, are in the main living room and are watching the New Year's special that was being broadcasted on television. So after playing video games for a while, my mom comes into the room and reminds us that dinner was going to be ready in about 30 minutes. She was making tamales de puerco y pollo and also champurado too. Still one of my favorite go-tos for the holidays, by the way. She also said that she wanted Ricardo and I to go to the little convenience store down the block so we could pick up a couple of extra plastic cups, as well as some soda. We sighed at the chore, but we eventually got up from our lazy boy so we could make the minute walk over there. I recall it being a pretty cozy evening, as fireworks could be heard throughout the night, and neighbors were playing music and held their own fun and festivities. When we got to the little convenience store, it was pretty empty, apart from just a store clerk, who I can remember had a look of, please, I just want to go home, written across his face. Poor dude, if only he knew about what was going to happen. Anyway, Ricardo and I immediately head to the back of the store where the refrigerators and refreshments are, and we spend the next minute on deciding on what we wanted to bring back to the party. It was while discussing, I happened to look toward the front window, which I had a perfect view of. There was somebody in your typical dark hoodie with the hood over their head, pacing back and forth and appearing to be acting almost paranoid-like. I pointed him out to Ricardo and we just made the assumption he was one of the local drunks who had been out drinking or something. We now made our way over to the Isle of Chips as I wanted to get some sabritas to munch on for when we resume our gaming session. This was when things were about to pick up. We suddenly heard the chime of the front doorbell ring, and just like that, someone is yelling at the cashier to open the cash register. Ricardo and I hid behind a display, and we could see the hooded figure I just mentioned as he's grasping onto a large knife and giving these commands to this cashier, who's got this look of absolute panic. Now, under normal circumstances, any normal person would have just stood there and hid, but for whatever reason, we both had this rush of adrenaline come over us. We both looked at each other, and we knew right away that we couldn't just let this guy get away with this robbery. So what do we do? Well, we sneak up behind him as he's distracted, and then when I'm just a mere inches from him, I pull a heel tactic of sorts, and I go for the low blow. This guy drops almost immediately, as Ricardo goes for the knife and is quickly able to smack it out of the dude's hand. I then go to grab it as the man takes a second to recover, before realizing he's lost his only opportunity to make off with some cash. He now books it out the front door, as Ricardo and I now give chase. Well, luckily some neighbors, after we yelled at the guy we were chasing, tried to rob the store, come out to assist us and are able to help with restraining the man until the cops arrived to take him away. We were both given an honor by the police department for our bravery, and as I mentioned earlier, everybody in the town talked about us whenever they would see either myself or Ricardo. Even at school, the students complimented us on our heroic deed. Looking back, would I have jumped into action and saved the day? Yes, yes I would have. In fact, that's one of the reasons to why I became a police officer, where I continue to enjoy a job of catching the bad guys and helping the good people in their time of need. This was five years ago during the month of December when I was in the process of moving to a new apartment on the other side of town. For the first couple of weeks of the month I did some yard sales over at my neighbor's house which was across the street and I was able to get rid of a lot of junk that I had saved over the years. Things such as old textbooks, posters, CDs, furniture, paintings, you name it. Whatever I wasn't able to sell in person, I listed online and I was able to rid myself of even more. By Christmas, I was pretty much ready to move on into my new place. All I needed to do was wrap up a few more things and have my neighbor assist me with moving a couple of my heavier belongings. 
On New Year's Eve, the day arrives and we ended up putting things into my neighbor Eddie's truck. We got to my new apartment roughly 20 minutes later, unloaded the first half, and then drove back to my own place soon after that to get some rest. This was when things were about to get quite interesting. When we pulled up into my driveway, the first thing I noticed was that their front door was wide open and it keeps swinging back and forth in the wind. I do recall it being quite windy, and I blame the wind as well as my lack of checking to lock the door as the reasoning behind why it was open. Anyway, my neighbor Eddie says that he would join me in just a minute to help as he wanted to go and feed his cat as well as use the restroom. I told them it's not really a problem as I was going to call my mom in the meantime. So I pulled out my cell phone, dialed for my mom, and then step into my house. But not even 10 seconds later, greeting my mom with a friendly hello, I went silent and told her that I was going to give her a call back. Rummaging through the little that's left in my kitchen was this really skinny man with long dirty blonde hair and tattered clothing on. So, uh, do you just walk into homes without even asking permission first? I said to him in a sarcastic tone as the man looks over to me and just stands and stares at me awkwardly. He doesn't give me a response for a few seconds, but when he finally does, something along the lines of, oh sorry, I thought this place was empty, was said to me. I started to feel that this undeniable sense of fear was now going to start taking control. I couldn't quite figure out why, but as I reminded him yet again he needed to leave my house, he sort of just snaps into this crazed anger. He starts yelling at me saying that this is his house and that I was the one that was trespassing. Yeah, not even a joke there, even when admitting he thought that the place was empty just a minute ago. Well, me being the so-called self-proclaimed tough individual I am, I stood my ground but then went cold when he does the unthinkable. He takes out a box cutter and that's when my confidence quickly goes out the window. I immediately book it toward the front door and coming up the porch steps was my neighbor Eddie alongside his older brother Mark. Now these guys are tough and strong, both are easily over 6 foot and about 250 pounds respectively. Mark and Eddie, bless their hearts, quickly jumped into action. Even though they could have ended up with a trip to the hospital, if not worse, they wrestled this guy to the floor, no questions asked, and they're able to secure the box cutter. I went and grabbed it and then proceeded to dial 911. Meanwhile, Eddie and Mark have this guy restrained. Officers would show up about 5 minutes later and they ended up handcuffing and arresting him. In short summary, I was told he was some homeless dude that was on some sort of crazy acid trip, which explained the way he acted that afternoon when I bumped into him. As for that New Year's, although I was still quite a bit shaken up, I was soon able to forget the encounter and move on with my life. By the way, I'm still friends with Eddie and Mark today, and I actually just picked up some Christmas gifts for their kids. To all of you listening, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a healthy and safe New Year. 2018 New Year's Eve I attended my co-worker Mandy's end-of-year party at her new apartment both her and her husband had just recently purchased. We had a potluck and everybody ended up bringing different assortments of food and treats. I was in charge of bringing the ham and that bad boy came and left within the first 15 minutes. It was soon realized after we had started eating that we had run out of plastic cups and with the attendees continuing to arrive, it was certain we would need more of them right away. Now Mandy did say that we could use her glass cups but I knew she wanted to do minimal dishwashing that evening. So I let her know that I had some extra cups at my place and I offered to go and pick them up. I had to convince her though since she was going to send her husband to the store, but I reminded Mandy I'm less than a 7 minute drive from her place, so it wasn't really a bother to me. Besides, it could give me a chance to check on my goldfish Sally as I didn't remember whether or not I had put some extra food for her. So I step out of her apartment at roughly 7.50pm and get into my neighborhood around 8pm. The streets were empty, and with the mist of rain falling on my windshield, the evening was very nice and peaceful. It's just too bad that in the next few minutes, that was going to change. As soon as I entered my house, I can hear footsteps coming from the second story. 
I do live with both my mom and dad, but both of them were at their own New Year's party and I was pretty sure that they wouldn't be home until later that night. I mean, I didn't even see the family SUV parked in the driveway. Now, for whatever reason, I decided to go and investigate the noise. Looking back, this was a really terrible idea. And as soon as I reached the top step, I ended up looking to my right, toward my bedroom where the door is open, and I see a figure. Someone's in all black attire, black gloves, and a ski mask over their face, going through my dresser. I remember letting out a yelp which in turn caught the attention of this home burglar. They now drop the duffel bag in which they were putting my belongings in and then walk out of the room toward my direction. I froze for a second, seeing the intruder has a hold of a knife. This revelation had me booking it down the stairs, out the front door, and into my car that was parked in the driveway. I then locked all my doors, drive across the street and call 911. I advised them of the home intruder. Meanwhile, I'm keeping a lookout to see if they'll end up running out my front door, but they never did. With cops showing up six minutes later, handguns and shotguns at the ready, they find the house was completely abandoned. No sign of the intruder whatsoever, apart from the mess that they had made. The police did do fingerprinting and whatnot, but because the intruder was wearing gloves and he was wearing a mask, I, nor them, were able to come up with a conclusion. None of the neighbors happened to have seen the man enter or leave my house, which was a shame considering they might have been able to help. As for what was taken, they made off with jewelry, my Blu-ray player, my dad's PlayStation 4, including some video games, and some extra money my parents kept in a jar. By the way, nothing happened to my goldfish Sally, and as for my friend's party, I just ended up dropping off the cups and I went back home, where my parents returned just a short time after. But lastly, we determined the home burglar got in through the door in the laundry room, which was connected to our house. That door was having issues with its locking mechanism, and we had never bothered to fix it. We also concluded that in the time I exited my house, this stranger ran out the same way he had entered from, then must have jumped over the backyard fence, into the alleyway, and that's how he got away. It was a day before New Year's Eve of 2013 in Southern California, and my best friend Cameron had come up to spend the holiday with my family and I. We had a bro day going to the arcade, going bowling and playing video games in the afternoon. At night, we got the urge to grab ourselves some french fries from McDonald's, and we drove over to pick some up. The line was pretty quick, so that was a good thing. After we exited the drive through we come up with a brilliant idea of driving up to Skylane. It's an unofficial name of a hillside in our city where you can get a pretty complete view of the entire town, and it's even on some very clear nights you might get the chance to see a shooting star, weather and lighting permitting. To get there, it's a bunch of twists and turns of dark lonesome quiet roads with fancy homes accompanying you along the way. The more you ascended, the less homes that you passed by, and eventually it was just the hillside. When we got there, we saw a young couple who we were guessing were out doing who knows what as they got into their car and left, meaning Cameron and I would have the whole place for ourselves. We parked next to a tree and then we got out and walked over to the cliffside, just a 10 second walk away, and we sat at one of the benches for the next 30 minutes, just talking about life and listening to some music and enjoying the peace and quiet of the nature. Just a quick side note here, but if you ever get the chance to see your city from such a high vantage point, do it. It's pretty awesome. What isn't awesome, however, is what would happen in just a few moments. We started to get pretty cold. It was a chilly lower 50 degrees that night, so we got up and began making our way back to the car. We got in, turned on the ignition, turn around at this dead end to start making our way back, and all of a sudden, this man in a hoodie jumps out from behind a tree, forcing me to step on the brakes and swerve ever so slightly, almost going over the cliff in the entire process. That in itself was one of the scarier moments of my life, and judging by the look on Cameron's face, he felt the same way. That fear quickly changed to anger, however, as Cameron jumps out of the passenger seat Meanwhile, I start to back up 
and I can hear my friend begin yelling at this random stranger. I pulled my window down to yell at him too, but something strange was happening. He kind of just stood there not saying a word, and I start to believe perhaps this guy might be high on something, or maybe he's drunk. I guess it happens at this time of the year, huh? Well, anyway, Cameron is now running back to the passenger door when the dude pulls out a knife and starts chasing after him like some sort of madman. He was actually just a few mere inches from stabbing him in the neck, and if it wasn't for his quick feet, I'm pretty sure that things would have ended badly. The man then proceeds to grab the door handle and opens the door, which sends us into a panicked frenzy as he then starts reaching in. Thankfully, he wasn't able to grab either of us, as I pressed on the gas and we left him quite literally in the dust. The last sight I do remember seeing was him trying to chase after our car, but then giving up and soon blending in with the cover of the darkness. We were both so scared that our bodies couldn't stop shaking. That was until we reached the more populated part of the city. We did end up reporting it to police, and we never heard anything back on whether or not they actually found him or not. We still believe he was just some dude that was out of it, and it was just a one-time occurrence since I don't ever recall hearing anything in the news about some guy with a knife going around and chasing after people in that part of the city. In any case, neither Cameron or I have been back there since. New Year's Eve 2000 still stands to this day as one of the more freakier days of my life. For reference, I was 15 years old, and I'm male. That New Year's Eve, we were throwing a family get-together at my grandma's house, a break from the years past that saw our parties take place at our house. My grandma only lived about 10 minutes away from me on the other side of town. It was really quiet in comparison to where I live. We were at the time living near our downtown district, so being around less traffic was always a nice touch. That night, we were also celebrating my grandma's 87th birthday, which added to our already fun-filled evening. Anyway, we arrived at my grandma's house at around 6pm, and I immediately went to join my cousins who had also arrived a short time earlier. In total, it was the four of us, which was perfect for the Nintendo 64 I brought with me. The others already knew the drill and each brought their own controllers. We spent the next couple of hours playing Mario Kart, Mario Party, and Super Smash Brothers as the adults talked, ate, and laughed at all their silly adult jokes. By 10pm, we ended up cutting the cake, saying happy birthday to my grandma, and then us kids proceeded to head out into the backyard to get some fresh air. I remember there being a little table set up with some extra snacks and drinks, where we proceeded to bring out the Monopoly board and start playing that for a while. After a couple of rounds, we decided to throw the old football around as we talked and looked up at the sky. Fireworks were already beginning to be shot off by the neighbors, even though I recall it still being half an hour before the new year. As we tossed the ball around, I accidentally made the mistake of throwing the football a little bit too hard. It flew right over my grandma's backyard wall and into the nearby alleyway. Well, that kind of sucked, I told myself. My cousin started to joke that I was such a strong guy as I tell them I would go and grab the ball and be back in just a second. So I opened the little back door that leads into the alleyway and I met with the vast void of complete emptiness. The alley was dark, only being illuminated by some lights with moths flying next to them. I tried to locate the ball as I head in the direction I thought I'd thrown it and all of a sudden I hear a loud crashing sound that makes me almost jump out of my shoes. Is anyone there? I recall saying in a nervous tone. Suddenly somebody stumbles out from behind one of the large dumpsters and I was now face to face with this large dark figure. Details were pretty hard to tell at first because of how dark it was, but as they stepped closer, I got a better look. It looked to be like a homeless man and he looked pretty angry. Is this your ball, kid? It hit me in the head as I was sleeping. I actually let out a quick laughing snort and then stopped myself when I realized I was talking to some random dude who looked like he was straight out of a movie and he looked like the main villain. Yeah, that might be kinda mean. I'm sorry, but that's what it felt like. Besides, I was a kid back then, and that's what I thought. 
All of a sudden, he reaches for something and then pulls out a screwdriver and proceeds to stab the football. I basically said, the heck with a ball, and begin running back. Meanwhile, I hear my cousins asking me what I was doing and what was taking so long. One of my cousins met me at the side door as I'm able to run and turn the corner to get in, and all of a sudden, I see his facial expression change. Run. Close the door already. Before he gets to do so, the crazy angry man comes barging into my grandma's backyard, and all of us teens take off running inside, screaming like banshees. One of my uncles overhears the commotion, and he's asking what was happening. We pointed toward the back glass sliding door, and he goes to check. The creep from the alleyway is banging on the door, saying he was going to kill us and all this other scary stuff. My uncle is now telling the man to get lost as my aunt starts to call 911. And as we waited for the police, my grandpa happens to see the man who is still in the backyard cursing and yelling at us. He said he recognized the man as a drug addict who lived in the area. And sure enough, when the police got there, they ended up talking with the man, who by this point had already calmed down a bit. We did return to our party and New Year's celebration, but one thing we did notice was that the police ended up taking him away. I am almost certain he had to have been under the influence of something that evening, because even if the ball had hit him like he said, no normal person in their right mind would come after you with a screwdriver and then wish for your death. Anyway, that's my crazy New Year's story. I sure hope none of you have to deal with something like this in the upcoming New Year's Eve, because there sure are a lot of crazies out there, and you don't want to get them angry. This was New Year's Eve of 2019, and it really makes me wonder about that old saying, being in the right place at the right time. There's also the complete opposite of that phrase, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that's not what really describes how I was involved. You see, that evening it was myself and my wife, and we had decided to hang out at this coffee shop that had just opened a couple of months before. They have a ginormous patio where they have a few showings for artists and musicians so they can perform and show off their work. It was really cool, and what was originally going to be maybe only 30 minutes of drinking some coffee, as well as watching the performances, it turned into the next two hours of enjoying this fun and quality entertainment. At around 11pm, I was starting to get kind of tired and I asked my wife if she wanted to go back home so we could watch the ball drop on television and then go to bed. She agreed, however she wanted to watch one more of the performances so she could enjoy the refill of hot chocolate she had just purchased. I said sure why not and so we sat for another little while. Oh yes, I haven't mentioned it yet, but there is a solid 100 people either seated or standing around just outside the patio as there's also a little viewing area from there. I'm only mentioning that size of the crowd because, apart from a couple of people who were clearly drunk, nobody was really causing any sort of problems. Fast forward to the set's completion. We got up, offer our table to another group of people, and we begin the short two minute walk over to the parking structure that's just across the street. A chilly breeze swept across our faces as cars passed by and pedestrians laugh and smile. As we walk into the parking structure, we get a break from the breeze, but now something else is beginning to unravel itself that would be the opening act of the end of the year celebration. There were a couple of women, mid to late twenties, who were standing next to and talking to some random man. We weren't just going to ignore them originally, but my wife points out that they look pretty distressed. Now normally I wouldn't get involved in other people's business. But when I saw the man grab a hold of one of the girls and began to pull her away as she began to scream, I knew in that instant that this was something clearly wrong. Therefore, I tell my wife to stay put as I quickly run over to join the two women and the strange man. Hey, what's going on? Let her go, I say in a loud voice, letting my previous years of experience being in guest controlled traffic take over. This doesn't involve you. Go away. The man says, as the woman is able to escape and now comes running over to my side. The creep now begins to yell at me in a drunken tone while I'm telling him to get lost and grow up from being a jerk. That only seemed to fuel the fire, so to speak, as without question, 
He bends down, puts his hand into one of his boots. Surely he wasn't tying them, I thought. Well, lo and behold, he pulls out a knife. Now he says that he was going to kill me. I won't lie. Hearing that did send chills down my spine. However, I wasn't going to let him get to me, my wife, or these two random innocent women. I have left this important detail out because I didn't want to spoil it at the beginning. I have a concealed license to carry, one of the cool parts about where I live. So if I am in any sort of danger, I have the right to defend myself. That's why I tell the man to back off, as I warn him I was armed with a gun. I brandish my pistol, not taking it out of its holster mind you, which thank god flipped the switch in this guy's head. He suddenly begins to apologize and he says that he was actually just messing around with us before I now tell him that cops were going to be involved. The man runs away, because obviously he wasn't man enough to face his errors, as both my wife and I talked to the women who started to cry. They tell us that the creep began to catcall them and was stalking them as they walked about. They were heading to their car to head home and that's when the guy suddenly came up to them in a rush. We would end up reporting the incident to the police who did a search of the area and after receiving our tips as well as tips from others who saw the man, they do manage to catch up to him. Thankfully he was arrested without further incident or any sort of violence involved. Those two kind women couldn't stop thanking us after that, to which I just told them I was doing my job as a good Samaritan. Now, I'm not saying that you should play hero all the time, as if you aren't well protected, you could possibly get yourself hurt. But if you have the chance to stop a threat and save somebody's life from potential danger, try to do something. Or at the very least, do call the police. Over the years, I've had a tradition of getting home from work, taking a shower, warming up some food, and listening to scary stories videos. Yourself included, Mr. Creepy Fox. Now, something I haven't done is actually write up an experience I've had and shared it. I guess part of it is being lazy, and another part is I'm too tired from work. But alas, here I am today. I'm here to share my experience I had in 2009 that even all these years later has ultimately left me with a scar, if you will, in my brain's memory bank. You just never really know what life is going to throw at you. Honestly, I'm not exaggerating when I say I may not be here if things went differently. Let's get into it before I babble even further. That night I was hanging out with a couple of my best friends. We shall refer to these buddies of mine as Jaden and Benjamin. Both of them are still friends with me today and we originally met in elementary school. Yeah, how cool it is to still get along with your childhood friends. That night on New Year's Eve, our plan was to hang out at Benjamin's house, watching movies, eating delicious food, and counting down the new year. At around 11pm, we came up with the idea of walking outside and heading down this little trail that leads you toward this really nice opening, which was next to Benjamin's house. At this said opening in the tree line, you get an amazing skyline view of our entire city. It's a roughly 10 minute walk, and sure enough when we arrived there was a couple of Benjamin's neighbors. They were really cool as we sat together with them, talking and sharing some sodas we had brought with us, along with a cooler. Yeah, sodas, not alcohol, as we're straight edge kids. Fast forward an hour later and we're jumping for joy as the sky is filled with fireworks coming from different neighbors in our line of view. It's at this moment I'm thinking to myself, wow, what a great decision. If I would have stayed home, chances are I would have just been in my room staring at the walls. My friends had the same mentality as we now started to settle and we continue to talk about our goals and dreams. The neighbors I mentioned had bid us adieu now and they had returned back down the trail presumably to get some rest. Now, so far you might be thinking to yourself, nice, some good friends enjoying their primetime years. What could possibly go wrong that makes this evening scary? Well, at around 1am, we ended up hearing these really loud pops coming from further down the trail. At first, we thought maybe perhaps they were firecrackers and kids messing around. However, the second barrage of pops had us thinking otherwise. They sounded more like gunshots, and now our laughter had turned into silence. Was there somebody out there with a gun? 
we weren't going to take any chances, so we decided to grab the cooler and blanket, and then took cover next to this really large tree. For those who don't know, if you fire around into the air, that bullet will come down eventually. It's not just going to fly into the atmosphere and then leave Earth's orbit. This was something we took into consideration, as a couple of more loud gunshots were heard, and they were getting closer. Soon enough, we can hear someone talking, but it's very nonsensical. Sounds like a drunken fool at a bar who's had way too much to drink. Benjamin ends up pointing in the distance, and this is when we finally get a visual on our culprit. There is a random man stumbling around with a beer can in his hand and a pistol in the other. I remember letting out a nervous gasp as the man begins to get closer to where we were hiding, continuing to curse at the air and waving his pistol around. Be quiet and wait until he's gone. Jaden whispered as Benjamin pulls out his cell phone and texts his mom and dad to call the police. Surely if he had tried calling 911, the man might have heard us whispering or had seen the light from the cell phone, and that's why Benjamin had to make sure to hide his phone's screen light to the best of his ability and ensured it was set to silent. These moments of waiting and uncertainty felt like an eternity as we waited for the arrival of the police and her evacuation. Now, all this waiting, the dude is still walking in our general direction and yelling at some imaginary individual. Just when it seems that he's about to walk away, however, we hear another gunshot and then a ricochet that sends chills down our spine. The man had shot directly at the tree that we were hiding next to. Some wood chips fell on us too, as we now take a look at each other to ensure that none of us have been shot. Thank God that we were left without a scratch. But one more scare like that, and we were bound to scream in complete fear. No more gunshots were fired, and instead the man finally begins to walk away and head down the opposite direction that leads you further into the wilderness. A minute later, we are able to hear police sirens and a helicopter in the distance, as well as what sounds like talking. It was the police, and they were here to rescue us. Sure enough, they locate our sorry selves and are able to get us to safety. My parents had already arrived as well as Jaden's, and there is now this small police task force beginning to form their mobile station. The whole neighborhood was evacuated, and about an hour later, the all clear was given. They had the man, and sure enough, as we later learned on, the man was not only drunk, but he was on drugs that evening. Needless to say, we counted ourselves very lucky because had he actually seen us, our lives might have been at jeopardy, not that they already were. I think that's what brought us so close. You have something so frightening and scary happen to you, that you ultimately take comfort being there for one another, even in the toughest of times. Here we are over 10 years later. Our plan is to get together and have a New Year's party with our kids as we welcome in the new year. Now, if there is anything I can leave you all before I wrap this up, it is going to be the following. If you are walking about at night on New Year's Eve and you hear loud pops, take cover. While chances are you're not going to have some maniac firing at you like with what happened to us, those pops might be gunshots and those might be bullets and they will eventually come down due to gravity. You just gotta be really careful since lots of crazy things can happen out of nowhere. It was three years ago, and as a Christmas gift to both my wife and I, we had moved into a brand new house, this happening during the final week of December. Because we still didn't have all the furniture in the house, for the first couple of nights, we slept on blankets and pillows. I'd say the only downside to this was the fact that the home still didn't have any sort of central heating system installed. This did mean that the cold Alaskan December nights were seeing us trying to fend off 10 degree weather, but that's what our little heaters and blankets were for. Anyway, I want to say in the fourth night we started to hear movement at odd hours. Now just to quickly give you a general idea, our home is one story. It has two bedrooms, a bathroom and a kitchen. Right above us was an attic. I guess more than anything it's a storage space where we had only used it to put some extra belongings in. 
Now bear in mind, we never saw anything in there that stood out to us as suspicious or that rang any sort of alarm bells. Either way, back to the noise in question. We wrote it off as some squirrels frolicking above our house and this does more or less seem to answer our suspicious minds. However, over time we started to notice food that was going missing. Not only that, but blankets, toilet paper, water bottles, all seemed to disappear into thin air. By this point we had set up some CCTV cameras, because my wife was going on about how her house was haunted. Now if only that was the case, I think I would have been a little bit more relieved by that, but I digress. One night was the turning point in our creepy happenings. Both my wife and I were sound asleep, but I woke up thirstier than a man in the Sahara Desert, so I went ahead and put on my slippers and head into the kitchen. But here's the thing. Before entering the kitchen, I was able to hear what sounded like somebody scrambling around, like when you catch a cat off guard and it gets scared, and it runs away. Honey, is that you? I called out to my wife, thinking that she was in here, but there was no response. I was thinking about it at first, and I thought maybe my wife was playing a prank on me, but that was impossible as I'd just seen her moments ago. So I write this off as my over-imagination and I go to pour myself a glass of water. Seconds after that, I notice in my peripheral vision what looks to be like a figure begin to crawl into my living room. I freaked out so badly that I grab a kitchen knife and I start to yell. And this figure, which was hidden by the dark of the night, ends up booking it and I'm able to hear footsteps heading upstairs. I chase them, but by the time I'm up there, the noise is now inside of the attic. Now, I will admit, as a man who thinks he's all that, and he's not as scared of anything, I was actually pretty scared to go up there, more so for the safety of myself, as well as my wife, who knew if this person had a gun, and if it was just one person, or there were more, so I don't take the chances. Instead, I do the smart thing and I head into my bedroom, and I lock ourselves in there, we call the police, who do arrive in record time, and when they ended up going into the attic, guess what they find? A man living there. No joke. All the pillows and blankets that had gone missing, empty food wrappers, toilet paper, you name it. Well, the guy did actually put up quite the fight, but they are eventually able to get him out of there. After all of that, we installed the security system, and we haven't had any sort of issues since then. Still, we sometimes get paranoid when we hear a random noise in the night, but like I said, things have been pretty good. Happy New Year, and stay safe everyone.